Dr. Judy Huang, Professor of Neurosurgery, Vice Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery, the Program Director of the Neurosurgery Residency Program at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Judy Wong, Director of the Neurosurgery Residency Program at Johns Hopkins. She specializes in the treatment of cerebral vascular disorders, such as brain aneurysms, carotid artery stenosis, AVMs, moya moya disease, and cavernous malformations. As a member of the Board of Directors of the American Board of Neurological Surgery, Dr. Wong plays an influential role in the training standards and certification of practicing neurosurgeons across the United States. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we have Dr. Judy Wong, Program Director of Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. Doc, how are we doing today? Great. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency? Really to be uh, the best resident that I could be, uh, to receive all the opportunities of training uh, and take advantage of them and really learn how to be a great surgeon and a great doctor, and to be positioned to advance the field, because I could see that my career was, you know, decades long, and that a, a seven-year residency was a, a golden opportunity to really prepare for that, you know, decades-long career, uh, and that it was very much a protected time also, right, because, you know, the, the environment is such that you're learning, you know, and as a learner, you are you know, much, you're, you're uh, uh, encouraged to be a sponge. You're encouraged to ask questions. You're uh, um, encouraged with criticism, honestly, sometimes brutal criticism about what things are wrong and how things can be better. And uh, so it was a, a time of tremendous growth uh, and evolution and fatigue and uh, hard work and, uh, you know, I think that those were, uh, that, that's why my goals were to make the best of it. So during your chief year, can you kind of take us through your mentality heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Sure. I think that um, one of the things that I struggled with uh, when I was looking for a job is I actually found myself enjoying many aspects of neurosurgery so that even though I was most interested in vascular, neurosurgery as a subspecialty, I actually enjoyed other types of surgery and I did not want to be pigeonholed into only doing one thing. So, so I started off thinking, well, I could take a job that, you know, allows me to do some tumors, allows me to do spine. And I actually thought that that was my ideal position to be able to, to take a job that would allow me to do different things. Then when I started the job search, I realized like that kind of job is really very rare. And, uh, and it doesn't really, um, there's not a lot of those opportunities. And that most jobs really were a little more restrictive. And, and, uh, and, and it didn't, it was almost, um, it was almost uh, contradictory to be uh, interviewing for one job saying that, you know, I'm interested in vascular and that's all I want to do. And you know, this is my focus. And then, you know, heading to another job where clearly their need was for spine surgery, uh, you know, and, and being able to actually make a point saying, well, I, I could take this job and be a spine surgeon and, and do, you know, take care of these patients and, and do research in, in this problem. Um, so that was a little, uh, almost felt a little um, um, unusual to, to have to be in that position. So that, that was a, a strange uh, evolution of me coming around and realizing that I needed to focus, that it was not it was not going to serve me well to be looking at different opportunities that were totally different, um, you know. And it, it made me realize what I really wanted, also. Um, so I, I think that uh, I had to change in my view of of what opportunities I would I'd be willing to consider. Um, you know, I was sort of under the impression that. You have to be a little flexible because good jobs are hard to come by uh, in academics. Um, and uh, I knew that I was positioned well with an excellent training, but, but even with that, you know, it's a lot of timing. There's a lot of timing with respect to what opportunities are available at the time that you graduate. And, and so I lived that, you know, in my chief year, that it was very much 
uh, timing and what was what was around at the time. And um, you know, it was it was totally different than every other experience in the past where you know people go through the match and it's very organized. You know exactly how many positions each program has. You know how many programs are in each state. You know, so it's very uh, very much open and, and apparent. And, uh, but when you're looking for a job, it's not transparent at all. And, and there's even uh, interviews where you are invited for an interview, but there's not really a job. And uh, so that's, that's another uh, uh, sort of a pitfall that is not apparent until you know, people go and, and look at the opportunity and realize it's not really an opportunity. So there's all sorts of all sorts of uh, variations like that. So during your career, did you ever consider going private practice or were you academic focused all the way? I was academic focused all the way. Um, I, I really felt that the environment of academia was what would drive me uh, the entire duration of a career. Um, I've always been very um, committed to being an educator. I mean, even when I was in you know, high school, I was a tutor. I just uh, really enjoy teaching and fundamentally understanding something in a way to be able to explain it to someone else. Uh, and and uh, I've always uh, been very committed uh, to being an educator. So I felt that being in academia was the uh, surefire way to do that. Now, as program director, what were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks within the systems? Well, I think you have to deliver. You deliver what you promise. Um, so you, you know, maintain excellence. You strive to do the best you can. And uh, fortunately for me, you know, doing the best I can worked out uh, that uh, people could appreciate, uh, you know, sort of the quality of my work and the efforts that I put into either shaping a program or, um, you know, whatever, whatever the task is. Um, that, uh, you know, you, you have to be good, good on your word. And, uh, and then, you know, you get a reputation for being reliable. And, um, and I think that, you know, people are always looking for individuals to be dependable and, um, you know, trustworthy. So uh, I think that um, I just continued, continue that. What advice do you have for the graduating chief residents and fellows as they enter the professional job market for the first time? First few years are very eye-opening, uh, you know, and lots of transitions, lots of uncertainty. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of unknown during that time. Um, I think that there's a lot of competing uh, priorities um, you know, as one starts off, because all of a sudden that protective environment of residency is gone, um, usually, okay? And, uh, and so I encourage people to stay in touch with their residency mentors and colleagues, uh, you know, co-residents and so forth, because that connection, uh, familiarity and uh, honest uh, advice is very grounding and very essential for people as they first start off. Um, and um, you know, everything's not always rosy. So there are tough times, you know, the first time you get a complication in the OR or first time um, something doesn't go well, or, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it shakes you to the core because all of a sudden it's you and it's not somebody else's fault. It's all on your shoulders. And, uh, and you know, sometimes that's very difficult for people to um, grapple with uh, if they haven't, you know, experience it before and there's people who take it very personally you know a, a personal um, uh, failure you know can can be very uh, uh, can unravel people uh, if if uh, they don't have support and so with that going on and then you know other pressures of um, you know fulfilling responsibilities that that are expected of you whether it's a hospital administration or managing staff for the first time um, you know, interacting with colleagues who are uh, jostling for similar resources as you, like OR time, for instance. I mean, there's a lot of um, sort of uh, uncharted waters to navigate in the beginning um, that, that is uh, all of a sudden, you know, thrust upon someone who's a fresh graduate uh, because they're usually not seeing all of that during residency. They may see a little bit here and there, but they're not the ones in the middle of it, usually. 
Now, with the world being basically virtual at this time right now, and a lot of these chief residents and fellows don't have the opportunity to be at national conferences to meet folks like yourself, what advice do you have for them regarding the outreach process? Yeah, yeah. I think networking is still essential. And, um, and I think that networks uh, that have been formed in the past remain strong. Um, and I think that uh, the uh, onus is on people with established networks to look out for the people coming behind them, right? And to take them under their wing and to make sure that they're available. Um, you know, I think that it really all starts during the residency time. You know, there's, you know, there's a built-in network right there. And so I think that people need to expand that and, and strengthen that. And, and uh, you know, people, uh, faculty at residency programs know a lot of people. And so it's, it's still, uh, takes someone, you know, to introduce some, you know, uh, uh, up and coming person uh, to another, another faculty member and, uh, and, you know, make connections. And uh, so, you know, it is true that some of the informal networking uh, is, is not possible right now. Um, but um, I think that there's still uh, ability to, you know, have a conversation with someone, whether it's a phone call or a, a video call. Um, it just, it kind of just looks different than it has in the past, but I think that the, um, it's still doable um, and it, it potentially takes a little more effort uh, on the people who do have established connections. Now, I know that there's a human component to being a surgeon, even though we do think that you guys are all superpower heroes, but what type of mindset is it that you would have given your younger self when dealing with complications in the OR? I think, um, you know, it's always hard when you are facing something that is unexpected and you know is forever changing someone's life. I think that the gravity of that situation is necessary to fully comprehend. I actually think it's essential to, to fully grasp that and, lit and get through it because it's, it makes you better. I think if you suffer uh, a little bit, um, it actually makes you better and think about how things could be different, what you would do differently next time, um, how do you avoid it. And it's, it's that um, sort of soul searching and you know, deep dive that actually makes one improve so that you can pass on that wisdom to your future self uh, and to other people, actually, to trainees. I mean, a lot of the teaching that I do is talking about uh, pitfalls to avoid. Well, how do I know about those pitfalls? Well, it's because I either saw somebody have that pitfall or I had it myself. And so, right, and that's, you know, we, we all, you know, those of us in education realize when we're training people and, uh, you know, teaching people to do things Sure, it's great when things go well, but a lot of the times the really advanced learning is to learn what to do when things are not going well and, uh, and how to stop it from getting worse. And, and a lot of times we can reverse disaster or impending disaster, you know, or avoid it completely. That's the key. Key is to how do you tackle each problem uh, in a way such that you avert disaster. So that's, that's the key of being an excellent technical neurosurgeon is to never get yourself in trouble and have the patient stay out of trouble. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams. <laughs>